مرحبان و اهلن بکم فی برنامج داخل واشنگتن ما اکوم مدیف اکوم روبرت ساتلوف شتا اروپا سا یکون تاویلان و باریدن بعد تسد اشور من الحرب بین روسیا و اوکرانیا لا تزال مفاجات تتولا قطعات روسیا بالفعل امدادات غاز عن الدول الاوروبية بسبب دعم هذه الدول لأوكرانيا والمشكلة الخطيرة التي تواجه مئات ملايين من الأشخاص الذين يرتجفون من البرد في فرنسا وألمانيا وبولندا وأمكنة أخرى ستدفور إلى سوال متى ستنتهي هذه الحرب هنا في أمريكا السوال نفسه يطرحه أيضا الديد من أعداء الحزب الجمهوري ونظرا لسيطراتهم على مجلس النواب بعد الانتخابات يمكن أن يتسبب الجمهوريون بمشكلات للإدارة التي تدعم أوكرانيا لأسباب أخلاقية واستراتيجية لمناقشة سياسات الدعم الغربي لأوكرانيا في زمن أزمة التوتر المتزايد مع كل من إيران والسين يسعدني أن أراهب باثنين من خبراء السياسة الخارجية في واشنطن أندريا ستريكر ونايل غاردنر Welcome back to Dachl, Washington. The year is ending with lots of foreign policy news in the headlines. There are wars going on. There are crises going on. Leaders from 40 African states are in Washington. We're going to turn to Andrea Stricker and Niall Gardner to help explain some of the biggest issues facing American foreign policy. We're going to start with the war in Europe. Russia invades Ukraine. After nine months, it looks like the United States is about to ship its most advanced anti-missile systems to Ukraine. Um, why now? What will this do if the Russians find that they no longer have the tool of sending these killer missiles and rockets to attack Ukrainian civilians? How might this affect the shape of the war, Niall? Well, thanks very much for having me on the show uh, today. And uh, as, as you point out, uh, Rob, uh, the United States is planning to significantly further uh, raise its level of support uh, for Ukraine. This is the right approach. Uh, and uh, for some time, uh, many here in Washington have been pressing the administration uh, to supply even more advanced weaponry in order to defeat the Russians. This has to be the goal here, the defeat of Russia inside Ukraine, get the Russians out of Ukraine altogether. Uh, I do think uh, sending uh, Patriot missiles would be a significant additional uh, advantage for the Ukrainians. They have fought with tremendous courage and success. The Russians are staring defeat in the face. So we must be absolutely wholeheartedly in support of the Ukrainians uh, as they seek to defeat uh, the Russians here. And so this is a big step in the right direction. I, I do uh, believe that often the, the Biden administration has been too slow in terms of sending uh, crucial, vital armaments, uh, missiles, etc., to the Ukrainians. They have done the right thing ultimately after tremendous pressure, not least from, uh, from, from conservatives who have said that Ukraine needs better, more powerful defensive uh, weaponry in order to fight uh, the Russians. Uh, it's good to see that uh, the, the administration is now moving forward with regard to the, the Patriot missiles, and Ukraine must be victorious over Russian barbarism and, and savagery. So, um, uh, Andrea, it looks like there's a chance that not only Russia may lose, but Ukraine may win. They're not, they're not always the same. Will, do you think Russia will allow that? Putin can allow Ukraine to actually win? Are you concerned that that a Russia facing defeat may do the unimaginable and and turn to um, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction to try to avert, avert defeat? Uh, we can't allow Russia to retain the territories that it had seized back in 2014, for example. Uh, I think that sends a worse message than having them fully defeated and pushed out. 
So if they're allowed to retain territory that they've taken, then they'll just view that as a precedent for future imperialism. But we really, we really ha do have to help Ukraine win and win quickly, and that's in the best interest of everyone. So let me ask you both the uh, the famous question uh, that David Petraeus posed in Iraq: How does this end? Does it end on the battlefield? Does it end at a negotiating table? How does this end, Niall? Well, in my view, uh, it's imperative that the Russians are defeated first uh, before you have any kind of of uh, negotiation, actually. And so, uh, in, in my view, the idea of negotiations now would only, of course, benefit Vladimir Putin. And it's no surprise that the French and the Germans, the EU behind the scenes, are pushing for a negotiated settlement, not least because large numbers of European companies want to get back to doing business uh, with, with the Russians. Uh, the Ukrainians, the Poles, uh, the Baltic states, the UK strongly oppose uh, to this, uh, this idea that you can sit down and negotiate with, with Putin. Unfortunately, I think within the Biden administration, there is a deep divide over this issue. There are, there are those who reject the idea of, of negotiating with Putin. Uh, there are those who support it. Uh, and I think it would be uh, the height of folly, it would be a huge mistake uh, right now to negotiate with the Russian regime because it would give them a kind of strategic advantage, actually. So the, the immediate goal should be to defeat uh, the Russians. Uh, and then you can talk about terms for for, for uh for dealing with uh, with Putin and make conditions. But right now, it would be a huge mistake. It would hand an advantage, I think, to uh, to Russia, uh, which they do not deserve at, at all. I mean, they are, they are losing on the battlefield. Let's ensure that they emphatically are defeated on the battlefield. And Andrea, do you agree? Or, or, is, or do you see negotiations as a, as a reasonable way to bring this to an earlier end? No, I actually, I completely agree with Niall. Uh, we do have to defeat them on the battlefield and make clear that we're not settling for them staying in Ukrainian territories. They have to be fully defeated. They have to be bled out, essentially, and uh, make it clear that this will not be something they want to do in the future, attacking another country. So let's expand the, uh, the discussion a little bit. Um, already, the war is changing Europe. Uh, with two new countries joining NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And that, Andrea, means new commitments for America. How do you evaluate American leadership, um, um, the American people's resilience, and the American popular attitude toward um, this faraway conflict uh, between Russian Ukrainian speaking peoples? I think U.S. support has been pretty consistent. Um, we are seeing a little bit of pushback on the right and the left. Uh, you know, people understandably worried about where our funds are going and whether we really have an interest in this. So it is up to the administration to continue explaining often and strongly that we need to fight the Russians in Ukraine and not in a NATO country. So that would involve sending U.S. troops potentially getting involved in a bigger conflict, uh, potential nuclear exchanges. So we really do need to make the point uh, that this has to be done overseas in Europe, and we don't want it to expand somewhere else. And, and Niall, um, uh, are you at all concerned that the new Republican Congress will be less enthusiastic about uh, supporting the Ukrainians than the outgoing Congress has been? I'm not not concerned, really, and I've spoken to uh, you know, a lot of uh, congressional officials over the last few weeks on the Ukraine issue. I think there is very strong bipartisan support for uh, robust U.S. military assistance. Uh, I think there will be a um, growing call, certainly, for uh, oversight, scrutiny of, of spending in, in Ukraine. I think that that is a that is the reality of the situation. Uh, I think that uh, certainly many Republicans uh, are keen as well for our European allies to step up to the plate and play a bigger role in terms of uh, reconstruction, post-war reconstruction, also uh, direct uh, assistance to the Ukrainian government. Uh, the main focus, I, I think, uh, for Republicans uh, with a new Congress is going to be on military assistance to Ukraine, ensuring that Ukraine can win the war on the battlefield. I think that's going to be the uh, the main the main focus actually coming from uh, the new Republican uh, leadership. 
Uh, and it is, of course, in America's national interest, as uh, Andrea has pointed out as well, uh, for the Ukrainians to be uh, victorious on the battlefield. This also helps the NATO alliance as well. And this means that the United States is far less likely to have to get involved in another war in Europe, actually. And so Ukraine is significantly weakening and degrading Russia's military capability. That makes the entire NATO alliance far, far safer. And this is in the U.S. national interest. OK, when we come back after the break, we're going to expand the conversation to other actors that are playing roles, uh, such as Iran, now engaged in a European conflict for the first time, and how all of this touches on what remains in the background as the overall um, major global conflict over the horizon, and that's with China. Um, back uh, with Andrea and Niall in just a moment. New Year's Eve, it's a moment of global celebration. Of course, it should only matter for all of us who use the Gregorian calendar, which marks the new year on January 1st. Billions of people around the world celebrate other New Years, whether it's the Chinese New Year, which this year is the year of the rabbit, starting on January 22nd, the Sri Lankan New Year in mid-April, the Ethiopian New Year in September, the Muslim New Year, which fluctuates around the calendar, or the Jewish New Year, which, according to tradition, happens four different times during the year, linked to different occasions, but which is most commonly celebrated with the beginning of the seventh month of the year, usually in September. But the default celebration is January 1st, and there is nothing that represents the start of a new year more than the dropping of the Great Ball in Times Square, right in the heart of Manhattan. When did this all start? The answer is 1907. The dropping of the ball was first organized by Adolf Ox, the former Jewish grocery store clerk from Cincinnati, Ohio, who bought the New York Times for a fire sale price of $75,000 as a way to highlight the Times' new headquarters. He started a celebration. After two years of fireworks, Ox wanted something even more special, more unusual, and he came up with the idea of a descending orb to mark the start of the year. First held on December 31st, 1907, to welcome 1908, the ball drop has been held every year since. Except in 1942, three weeks after Pearl Harbor, and in 1943, both in observance of wartime blackouts. Over the years, more than a million people would fill Times Square for the ball dropping street party, events that are now mirrored in virtually every time zone in the world. So, wherever you are, celebrate the start of another year with your own special event. And join me in wishing that 2023 is a better, happier, healthier, and more meaningful year than the one that is ending. Again, my guests today include Niall Gardner. Niall is director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation, one of Washington's most influential think tanks. Previously, he served as foreign policy researcher for British Prime Minister Thatcher. We are proud to note that Niall was named one of the 50 most influential Britons in the United States by the London Daily Telegraph. Also joining us is Andrea Stricker, Andrea's Deputy Director of Non-Proliferation and Biodefense at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies here in Washington. She is the author of multiple books and op-ed articles concerning rogue regimes, nuclear weapons proliferation, and illicit arms procurement networks. All of that, uh, in one word, uh, can be pointed to Iran. So that's why I'm going to begin our conversation in this part of the discussion, asking Andrea about Iran, um, which, uh, with all of its previous um, uh, um, uh, nefarious activities, has taken an unusual leap 
into direct conflict in a European war. Uh, Andrea, what is Iran doing and why do you think it is doing it? Well, it has expanded its cooperation with Russia considerably uh, since the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal. Uh, and that's because the UN resolution under that implements the deal, it, uh, it allows arms cooperation uh, starting in 2020. So there was an arms embargo against Iran and now that's expired. So uh, Iran is still violating part of, parts of the resolution though, they're by providing drones, they're providing hundreds of drones to Russia to use against innocent Ukrainians. And they're planning to send missiles as well, maybe shorter range missiles, they claim. Uh, but this is unprecedented. Like you mentioned, we have Iran as a, an active player in a European war. And I think what's interesting is from contacts in Europe, I'm just not seeing anything, a sense of a, a growing threat from Iran. Still, they seem to think that it's that Iran is not a strategic threat to Europe. Niall, um, uh, uh, the nuclear deal with Iran is currently frozen and and uh, um, you know on life support at at the very most. Um, if that's the case, and if diplomacy is not really a functioning path to address Iran's continued march toward uh, nuclear weapons capability, is there an alternative plan out there? Well, that's a great uh, question, and I think as Andrea pointed out, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JSPOA or Iran nuclear deal, uh, this is dead in the water. Uh, and this idea of reviving this, this deal, uh, I think is, a, uh, uh, is really delusional. Uh, and I'm not sure if anyone seriously believes that it can be uh, revived, even within the Biden administration. I, I do think there are signs of officials giving up on this. Um, the deal was bad in the first place. It was a weak need deal. It should never be, uh, in my view, uh, revived anyway. Uh, but as an alternative, uh, we have to ensure that the strictest and toughest possible sanctions are in place against uh, the Iranian uh, regime. Uh, this is not only, of course, uh, a dangerous rogue regime that seeks to uh, build nuclear weapons capability. It is also the world's biggest state sponsor of terror, uh, a massive human rights abuser, uh, it is a, uh, as we're seeing in Ukraine, a growing threat on the global stage as well, even in Europe, supplying the Russians with hundreds, even thousands of uh, so-called kamikaze drones to be used against the Ukrainian people, against civilian targets primarily. Uh, so this is a, a regime that is a, a collaborator closely, of course, with Russia, also increasing with China uh, as well. So uh, we need to have uh, the strongest possible sanctions in place, but also uh, we need to be uh, assisting our allies in the Gulf states on the front line facing uh, the Iranian threat. Uh, and at the end of the day as well, uh, I think for Israel, our closest ally uh, in the Middle East, for the United States, Israel faces an existential threat from Iran. Uh, the Iranian regime is threatened to wipe Israel off the map. Uh, I'm in no doubt that if Iran uh, moves forward, with its nefarious plans to uh, build nuclear weapons capability, uh, the Israelis will strike against, against Iran. I think that is uh, almost inevitable, actually, uh, if Iran continues down this path. Uh, and unless, of course, the, uh, the United States and its allies adopt an even tougher stance against Iran in order to prevent it from gaining uh, nuclear weapons. Otherwise, I, I do believe the Israelis will take unilateral action all right. Well, on that, we're going to have to bring this conversation to a close. Um, complicated, violent, dangerous world. Thank you so much, Andrea and Niall, for helping explain what the, what the American and Western approach should be to deterring and defeating the aggressors, Europe and Asia. Thank you for joining us on Dackle Washington. Time magazine recently announced its Person of the Year. And the person so recognized this year was no surprise, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. No one in 2022 came even close to dominating the nonstop news cycle like he did. No one in 2022 came close to elevating all of us through his remarkable courage and leadership, providing something undeniable, indescribable, yet essential to Ukraine's near miraculous success in beating back Russia's brutal invasion 
surviving a terrible assault on its people and its land, and then turning around the battlefield into what appears to be a rout. Of course, the war is not over, but what Zelensky has done and what he has motivated the people of Ukraine to do is nothing short of heroic. Time's Person of the Year is often a figure of great historical renown. Albert Einstein ranked as Man of the Century, Churchill as Man of the Half Century, with lots of presidents, kings, popes, and magnates in between. Honorees, however, aren't always so heroic, so universally acclaimed. Hitler, Stalin, Khrushchev, and Khomeini all got their magazine cover. After nine men, the first woman was Wallace Simpson, the American divorcee for whom King Edward gave up the throne. The first woman who got her cover, and then 16 years later, the second was Queen Elizabeth. Sometimes an honoree's fame is fleeting. Who recalls Owen Young, Hugh Johnson, or Harlow Curtis? Names I never heard of before writing this essay. Even inanimate objects have been recognized, like 1982's Machine of the Year, the computer, and 1988's Planet of the Year, Endangered Earth. Zelensky was such an obvious choice this year, his selection muted discussion of who else might have deserved the honor in the event Russia's brutal invasion never happened. Here are a few thoughts on what might have been. Top of the list, in my view, would be the women of Iran, whose bravery has not only transformed the politics of that long-suffering country, but has changed the way we think of potential change there. The rebellion that has shaken the entire country is so much more than just about the hijab. It's about the entire system. But it is no coincidence that it started with protest by women against the indignity of being denied choice and control about their lives. If one were to look domestically here in America, here are a few other candidates. What about Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, and the other Republicans who sacrificed their careers, at least for now, for standing up to Donald Trump? and pursuing a serious investigation into the insurrection of January 6th? What about the children of school massacres, especially the Uvalde, Texas shooting in 2022, which echoed earlier shootings in Newtown, Parkland, Columbine, and elsewhere? What about the abortion-seeking American woman, now forced to travel far from home to make a decision about her own life and her own body that government can now deny her? And what about the American voter who somehow navigates 10,000 different sets of rules and still comes to the polls to inject some common sense, some middle of the road realism into an overheated, polarized American political scene? These are good, solid candidates all. They may not get a cover on Time magazine, but I hope they get their due. Behava nasalu el nehayat hadha hil halka min baranamaj dakhil Washington. In kan ladaykum ay istafsarat o ta'alikat hawl hadha hil halka. Wa khasatan hawl el harb el ukraniya wa siyasa el wilayat mutahada dakhliya. To wasalu mai Aber Twitter, a la hashtag Inside Washington. O Rasaluni Mubasharatan, a la at Rob Satloff. Arakum el Sboel Mukbil, Shukra Lakum, wa illa laka.